afternoon, everyone. Thank you for that lively introduction, Dennis. Um, as Dennis said, my name is Theo Phillips. I'm a lead trainer and uh, consultant with the Youth Development Institute. And today I'm also joined by a couple of, a couple of our other colleagues, uh, Tyler McCormick and Pardis Powell McGoy and our homie Shaylan Thomas is in the house as well. Um, I just want to be very clear, you know, we have a group here and everybody that's with us has a role. Um, as Dennis said, for the most part, I'll be hosting this session, um, but Dennis and Pardis will also be jumping in and out and Tyler as well. And uh, as the host, one of the, one of, as the host, um, I'm the main person speaking, but Shayland will also be doing a lot of the behind the scenes stuff in terms of like organizing the breakout rooms, uh, really looking at the chat and making sure that anything that's happening in the chat is brought to our attention and just overall housekeeping that's going on. So if you have any concerns, uh, if you get kicked out, um, she's the person that's going to kind of get you back into the groove of things and keep you engaged with the group as well. So welcome to session one, um, engagement and connectedness, implementing a work readiness experience in a digital realm, the power of the do. Uh, today, we're really going to, and over the next three days, we're really going to do our best to try to give you a real feel of what virtual project-based learning can look like, um, you know, just from how we started the session with the music and the lively introduction and just making sure we have folks in roles and prepared to go is really kind of step one. So welcome, everybody. Thank you. I'm going to give you a quick uh, rundown of the agenda. So we've got welcome and introductions. We're going to do, we're going to look at the summer and scope of sequence for the summer scope and sequence for, for your, for your next couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to look at YDI's framework and really dive into connectedness uh, because for us, relationships are really at the heart of all this stuff, all the work that we do with young people. Uh, we're going to talk about the role of hope and goal setting. We're going to talk about instructing and facilitating and how those two things kind of live together in this world and in this space. We're going to talk a little bit about asynchronous and synchronous work and not only what that looks like for the young people and for the participants in the program, but also for you as the facilitator through this process and kind of the different kind of things you have to do to be prepared. And um, we're gonna wrap up today by beginning to talk about group formation and really what that looks like in this virtual space. And some of the, some of the things, um, specifically uh, the role of the facilitator in the beginnings of group formation. And then we're gonna wrap up, we're gonna close, we're gonna do a quick reflection um, and we're going to get you out of here on your day. So that sound good for folks? All right, okay. You're, you're muted, my friend. Ah, oh, somebody always does it. <laughs> so just want to talk to you a little bit about the Youth Development Institute. Again, my name is Dennis Carter, and I'm a program director at the Youth Development Institute. And, you know, we have a simple mission, and our mission really is to improve the lives of young people through the end of the integration of positive youth development. And, and for us, like, that's what it's all about. We, when we think about the way that, that adults who are working with young people are going to have a positive impact on their lives, we really do believe that positive youth development, which is a, an asset-based, a strength-based approach to working with young people, is a critical element to be uh, kind of moved into the process. So we're primarily a, a capacity building organization. Um, we provide technical support by the ways of training. We provide content and curricula. Um, we do coaching. Um, and so at really across a broad spectrum, we work with organizations, institutions, corporations. We believe that any place where a young person is being served is a place that positive youth development should be implemented. And therefore, it's a place for us to work. So we're, you know, when we think about technical assistance, we do think about like how are programs designed? What are the what are the types of things that are actually happening there? And how do you begin to really think about the work that you're doing from soup to nuts so that you're really thinking about what's going to happen with a young person from the time they walk into the door to the time that you effectively transition them out of your programming? And then what's all the things that need to happen in between? And, and for us, we do that with three clear strategies. And, and the first one is that we really look to disseminate information. 
And the types of information that we disseminate are really things that are, are born and, and crafted out of, you know, either both theory and practice. So we really do look to blend information that, you know, that has come from sort of like scholarly places or have come from research and then really try to work with, with providers to make sure that it makes sense to them. And for us, it really is kind of like things like this, like where we may spend some time presenting some information and getting feedback from providers and then not only sort of having that information live within that singular group, but really being able to push that information back out to the larger field. And that leads us really to another thing that we're able to do, which is inform policies. So all too often, we, one of the things that we really try to make sure is that people understand like what is a policy and really making sure that they understand it in, in the in the end a policy is an investment it's a way that the work that people are doing really takes on a meaningful means to an end and by having us be able to work with organizations that are developing said policies again sometimes it is those government organ it is those government in institutions it is corporations that are really thinking about how are young people going to be impacted and really using research and and practitioner driven research specifically to really help people make decisions which is that final kind of aspect of our work and we like to talk about conducting research both with a big R and a little R. Sometimes we'll we'll spend we'll take the time to really go out and and work with organizations that are doing real kind of technical research where they really are developing studies and really looking at how things are being impacted and it is with a researcher and we we like to think about that as the way that most people think about it traditionally. But because we also are so um, kind of grassroots driven, we think about sort of like little r research. So this is this these dialogues again that we might have is a form of research because we're going to say something today, and ultimately what we really love is when our participants, our partners, give us feedback. So like you know we we posit this, we believe that, and you're like, nah, that doesn't fly. I've been working with kids for 20 years, and I'm, I'll tell you right now that won't work that to us that's a form of research and the more that we're talking to each other we really are saying whether or not in our day-to-day -day work these things that others are presenting to us as as best practice are they so we look at that as a form of research and it kind of really then leads us back to the top where now we're disseminating that and then we're letting that inform policy so we work sort of both forwards and backwards so that everything that we're doing is really well balanced so that's the Youth Development Institute. And I, so let's talk a little bit about how we might work today and actually over the next three days. So we know that this is very different, right? So like we are an organization, if you look right from the very beginning, like, wow, who does a virtual something where you've got five staff members from the organization trying to really trade with 24 people? Well, we do because we're working in a virtual space. And what one thing Theo talked about was he talked about roles. And, and one of the things that we want to be really clear on is that over the next few days, we're going to be working in and out of roles. And we really want to have some things that we believe are normal to allow us to be able to actually all work together and function. So we'd like to bring forth to you a couple of really quick things that have we've really found effective in helping us in this virtual space. One, what we're really going to ask us to be able to do is that we focus on our time together. You know, if, when you're working in a virtual space, the easiest thing to do is to kind of allow the phone to ring or allow something else to happen. But what, because we're really spending such a, a little bit amount of time together, um, it's really going to be important that we try not to multitask. We really just want to lock in on what we're doing and then be able to, to, to move through, excuse me, our agenda. Um, we're we're going to look to create an order um, for us to be able to, to share. You know, one of the things that we will do is that there's a there's a a, a function in in Zoom that allows people to raise their hand, um, both sort of digitally. But we've got the the chat. We've got literally like you can raise your hand and kind of just say you want to say something. So we'll figure out what's the best way to work, and then once we figure that out, we'll use that so that everybody gets a chance to share and that we'll all know how we're gonna share. 
Uh, we ask that because we're going to be talking as best as possible that you try and find a quiet space to, so that so that you can share um, and that you can participate without distraction. But again, recognizing that sometimes that's possible, sometimes it's not. Um, we're going to ask that if you have headphones, um, that you use them so that everybody can hear you. Again, so that you're really able to, to, to participate in this session. Um, I talked a little bit about re, we use kind of like use the hand raising or chat function so that you can communicate. Again, one of the things that's going to be the most important is that we really find a way to kind of get feedback around the things that we're talking about so that we can really make sure that our sessions are designed to really allow you to kind of accomplish what you want to accomplish this summer. And then finally, we really like seeing faces. So we, we, we appreciate everybody who has their cameras on. Um, I think it's, it's really cool for all of us to know that we're all in this together. So we really appreciate seeing your faces. And then finally, we're going to do some stuff um, that we think is fun. And we want to say to each other, like, it's OK to have fun even in this virtual space. So those are some of the norms to sort of know that are going to kind of help guide us in our journey together over the next three days. And I know that you guys have been participating in virtual meetings, um, doing sort of other virtual work, and want to offer this up as an opportunity if anybody would like to add anything to our virtual norms um, to allow us to really work smart over the next three days. Okay, so if right now uh, we, we move forward, that's fine, but we're going to keep this up. Like I said, we're going to be working together over the next three days. If something happens or if something kind of comes to your mind and you say, oh, I wish we would have, please feel free to throw it in the chat. And the next time we meet when we review our norms, you'll find that it's made its way to the list. So, so please, over the next you know, 90 minutes, I'm sorry, we've already used some time, over the next 70 minutes, please, if you have a thought about something that we might add to our virtual norms list, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat. Um, you can either send it directly to one of us or you can put it out there for everybody to see. The choice is yours, but both ways work. All right, so the, the, here's gonna be the thing that, you know, as we go through this summer, if we can leave with everybody understanding this, this next, this slide right here is gonna serve us all well. You know, we've gotta be intentional. You know, when you're working with young people, whether virtually or in person, nothing can happen by chance. Everything has to happen by design. And we really want to encourage you to think about every step, everything that you're going to do so that it happens in an intentional way. The one thing that we'll say is that the way that the young person experiences the things that you're doing for them, now that should be organic. A young person should really walk away from a facilitated session, an instructional session with you, and really feel like, wow, this landed for me organically. I really can make a connection to, you, to my own life. This makes sense. But all of that starts and stops with you making sure that you are, are creating a, a virtual space that's intentional and that everything that we're trying to do is designed to be successful. So again, as I said, young people can experience what we've done organically, but we know that it starts with our schedules, it starts with our plans, it starts with all of the things that we do before they see us and ends up with them having a, an amazing experience. Yeah, and I'd just like to echo that the, the, one of the things that's really important, especially when we're gonna talk about completing a group project, there has to be a group first. Right, so we have to be really intentional about how we create that group and how we create that foundation. So as our young people start to work together in this group and start challenging each other, there are relationships in place that allow them to push each other and allow them to kind of move forward as a group. Great, so that's a, a good segue for me. Um, I'm just gonna reference this document for a moment. We're gonna go a lot deeper into um, the schedule for the summer, really Wednesday and Thursday, but we have created a scope and sequence um, and Scott and I have been furiously working on this um, so that you can see alignment between both the project-based learning sessions as well as hats and ladders 
uh, ladder courses on the app and then facilitated lessons as well. So this is a, um, an older version, but you will have a new version of this. What's really great is that everything that young people will have to do for each week will actually live in a Google Classroom. Um, so Scott and I are working on that this week. We're setting it all up um, and we will share some of that on Thursday so you can get a sense of how the weeks are unfolding and the content that is there. But it's a way to make this very seamless so that your young people log into their classroom, whether they have the 30 hour model or the 15 hour model and week by week they can see everything that they need to get done with any necessary hyperlinks as well. Um, so that's going to make just navigating all these different tools and resources much more seamless for both you and the young people that you'll be working with over the summer. Thanks, Tyler. All right, let's jump into the soup and the nuts. All right, so this is a uh, YDI's framework. Um, and these three spheres, um, the way they interact, we really think are what are necessary to produce a young person that's thriving. So when, one of the things we really look at is connectedness. And what we understand from practice, from research, is that young people do everything from relationships. Um, that's not only relationships with each other, that's relationships with you and them. And then that's also that connection to the larger picture. And that's extremely important, especially in this virtual space where we don't have necessarily a physical space to be with young people. So we have to really make sure that we're creating this sense of program in this virtual space. So the other piece is we're, when we talk about preparation, we, also, we believe that all young people strive for mastery. Now the pushback on that is young people might not be mastering or wanting to master what we want them to master at the time. And that's okay, right? But part of that is we use our relationships with them, we use our connectedness with them to then start to shift and change how they, the things that they wanna master in their lives, right? Ultimately, so that they can authentically participate in this world, right? Because one of the things that we understand is that young people gain confidence through actual opportunities to impact the world around them. So as we're thinking about this project-based learning kind of situation in this journey, really thinking about ways we can inject youth voice, youth roles as leaders within this, within the, how the program shapes and shifts throughout the, throughout the weeks, um, just so that young people really do get to exhibit all of, exhibit and practice all the things that they're learning throughout these weeks. So over today, uh, we're really going to focus on connection and really building that relationship. So connectedness really starts by showing a young person you care. Right? So showing a young person you care comes in the form of a lot of different faces. So I'm going to ask a quick question to this group, right? So if you had a supervisor that was checking in on you every day and asking you how you felt every day, how would you feel about it? Would you feel good about that? You can say it out loud. You can put it in the chat. You can do a thumbs up. You can do whatever you like. But how would you feel if, if, a, if a supervisor asked you every day how, you, how they felt about you? I guess I'll go with nobody saying anything. Sure. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, initially, I would be all right with it. But if I see him every day, I may feel like <clears throat> he's checking on me, like I'm not doing a good job or something, like he's writing me. I, I may feel like, you know, you're, you're, you're crowding me. Is what I may feel. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Anybody else feel that way or have a different type of feeling around that? When you say checking up on, like, or just checking in, checking, checking in, in, just like, how are you doing? Yep. How are you doing? Yeah. Um, I think I would be fine with that. But if they were like asking, like, how are you doing on that assignment? That's where I'd be like, okay, right. Leave me alone. <laughs> Get out of my face. All right, uh, Sharmika, were you going to say something? Um, so, I was just going to say, if they're just asking, like, how are you today? How are you feeling? That's cool. But if every time I turn around, I see them, I would feel micromanaged. And um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't get along too well with those types. <laughs> I, I don't know too many people that really enjoy being micromanaged. Um, but, you know, that to be said, all that being said, we really want to think about how we're going to check in with our young people on a daily basis, right? And in doing that in a way in which is authentic, so that they feel like you really legitimately do care, and that you're not just either checking a box off or micromanaging them, right? 
So you're going to think about very specific intentional ways in which you can create check-ins with your young people, whether that's through uh, just having a conversation about it every day and saying, hey, every session when we log in, we're going to spend the first five to 10 minutes doing a quick check-in to see where people are, or we're going to do, uh, you know, hey, in the, in the chat, everybody from one to five, tell me how you're feeling today, or doing a weather report, however you want to do it however you want to figure out what that system is that works best for the young people you're working with, having that very specific intentional time that's in place where you're checking in helps, you know, helps people navigate, right? I know if I knew that the place where I had to go every day for the next couple of weeks, I knew if they, there was a space for me to, to um, express some of the things that are going on in my life or in my world and it's going to be legitimate, that helps me when I'm in that space dealing with that problem, right? If I know that when I get to my, my, when I log in, the people that I'm logging into, they care about how I'm doing, I'm much more likely to log in, right? And when you think about, you know, back when we went places, when we went to work, you know, when you actually left the house to go somewhere, you wake up in the morning and you sneeze, you know, if you know that the people at your job really care about you, you get in, you get in the shower and you go about your day. But if you don't think that people care about you, you sneeze, then you cough, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I need to lay down, you know? And it's really, really, it, it really does affect and impact how you show up when you know that the, pl the place where you're going, people care, right? So once you've built that care up, it's really important that you start building that trust. And trust comes with things like consistency, transparency, clear communications. And like, like Dennis said, and with our norms, as we think about this throughout the time is really having those clear ways in which you communicate, right? Having your young people know how to get in touch with you and when they can get in touch with you. Because the concept of an open door policy isn't necessarily always true because we're not always in front of a computer these days, right? And even when we were in offices, we weren't always in our office. So just being very clear about what, what that system looks like for your young people. Because once you show them that, they, that you care, once you start to build that trust, it gives that sense of belonging, right? And with that sense of belonging comes that, that sense of safety. And when you think about belonging, thinking about having these norms that your group is using to function with, having schedules, having group names, and not just being like, oh, this is the project-based learning group, you know, come up with a name for it so that young people feel some sort of connection to it. Uh, and then once you feel that, have that sense of belonging, you start feeling safe. Once you start feeling safe, it's much easier for you to take chances, much easier for you to learn things that you weren't willing to learn in the past, right? And then not only, not only learn things, but then exhibit the things that you've, you've learned freely and openly, right? Because one of the things we really wanna make sure that we're doing is that we're creating space for reciprocity. Because reciprocity is where it's a give and take situation where we're giving stuff to young people, but young people are also giving stuff back to us. And the, and the funny thing is, is that each one of these things that we just talked about live in the check-in. Like the very, like right from the very beginning, if you want a young person to answer you about how are you doing, we're not talking about content. We're just literally talking about how are you doing? It, it's going to be very important that you are creating a space that allows them to feel like it's a question that not only they can answer, they should answer. Does that make sense to everybody? Because even now, in a simple question like, does that make sense to everybody? If you, if you think about it, like, unless we establish a safe environment for ourselves, even in this space, the simple thing of saying no actually could, for some people, be a, 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 a bit of a challenge because you don't know how a person is going to respond to a simple question like, does that make sense? So that's why when we talk about people doing things through relationships and the sense of connectedness and how important it is to kind of get the work that we want to get accomplished done, again, there it is. Because it, it, it's not just about getting young people to feel connected to you so that they'll be able to accomplish the big things. It's also making sure that in this virtual space, that young people will feel connected to you all kind of kind of runs one thing to another you froze for a second there but I, I i just i think i think we got the gist of what you were saying um 
So yeah, and you know, one of the things that we've all, I've heard from young people on a consistent basis is I can't learn from somebody that I don't like, or I can't learn from somebody that I don't have a relationship with. So it's really important that we, we really start here with building this relationship. So we're gonna move forward. And before, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shape kind of this video that you're gonna see right now. This video is going to be also shared with the young people. And it's gonna be one of the first things that they kind of see as they log in uh, to their first session for FYEP, all right? For their summer youth experience. person who was not successful that didn't have a great amount of self-discipline within their life uh, self-discipline and being able to perform and being able to keep your life on schedule and being able to keep commitments and promises and meet deadlines is essential to success your self-discipline is essential in your life and in my life if we're going to get things done to me, the very fundamental purpose of life is to find out how many skills I can acquire that have utility and then put that utility to the test in service of something greater than myself. Now, once you've accepted that you have as much right to success and much right to succeed as anybody else, the next step is learning how to talk the talk. You have to get fluent in the language of success so you speak it with ease. Surround yourself with people who've accomplished their dreams and immerse yourself in the culture of achievement. I want you to take some notes and some things and I want you to think about your goals and dreams in the three categories that I mentioned, personal, professional, and your social contribution. How many of you are serious about your goals and dreams? Raise your hands, please. I want you to write this down. Let us say together, as you think about your goals and dreams, let us say together, it's possible together, please. Yes, write that down. But he, he gave me a different vision of myself. I was in his class waiting on another student. He came in and said, young man, go to board and work this problem out for me. I said, oh, sir, I can't do that. He said, why not? I said, I'm, I'm not one of your students. He said, look at me. Yes, sir. Go to the board and work the problem out anyhow. I said, sir, I, I can't do that. He said, why? I said, sir, because I'm educable, mentally retarded, sir. I'm in special education. And the students started laughing. They said, that's Leslie. That's not Wesley. He's DT. Wesley is the smart twin. He said, what does DT stand for? I said, um, I'm the dumb twin, sir. And as the students laughed at me, he came from behind his desk. He looked at me and he said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. Let us say together, it's necessary. Write that down. It's necessary as you look at your goals and your dreams, it's necessary that you have a, a strategy and a game plan to change the story that you believe about yourself. And that's an ongoing process. But I realize that, that you have to work on yourself on a regular basis, and write this down, for mental mindset. For mental mindset and stamina. Because things are going to happen to you. You have something special. There's something you want to do. Because you don't know how to do it doesn't mean that you can't learn. I, I like something that I heard. You don't have to be great to get started, but you have to get started to be great. Repeat after me, please. Leap and grow your wings on the way down. So like I said, um, that's a video that's going to be shared with the young people as they get started on this journey um, with their summer work experience. Uh, and, you know, just some of the things we're going to we're going to really talk about the role of hope in all of this and how you keep young people motivated throughout a pro throughout this process, um, especially when we're talking about a situation in which, you know, they've been confined for the last couple of months. Um, and really what that's going to look like and kind of the kind of the things they were hoping to do this summer that they will not probably be able to partake in. Um, so really talking about the, the role of hope in this whole process in terms of group formation and and relationship building and connection building. 
So we're going to go into uh, some breakout rooms right now. Uh, and what we're going to do in these breakout rooms is we're going to look at these three different questions here and really kind of examine them in, a, in smaller group settings. So we can also, uh, it also gives us an opportunity to connect and, uh, and build with some of you guys in a smaller group setting. So Shay, send us to our breakout rooms. Why am I one of the last ones to go to a breakout room? I see. Okay. <laughs> Did you guys get um, a notification, Scott? Scott? Scott, are you having a, any troubles getting into any of the breakout rooms?
Hello, everyone is in breakout rooms right now currently. So I'm going to switch you over to, were you in a breakout room previously? I was, and then something happened to my internet connection. And next thing I know, everybody froze. And then I had to, it went offline, it was crazy. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember which one you were in particularly, or it doesn't matter to you? Um, the late, It doesn't matter. I think the lady with her name was like, she said oh, she was oh. the director or something. It began with a P. Oh, OK, you were with Pardis. Um, let me see where I put her. OK, so I'll put you in breakout room two. OK. Thank you. No problem.
we all back? Everyone is back. Uh, okay. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, let's see. Who would like to start with the report out? What do we, what do we, what do we find out about hope in our rooms? Dennis Pardis. Sure. So, you know, we, in our group, we really talked about, you know, the notion of hope having a lot to do with faith. Um, and and faith having a lot to do with really being able to expect that something is going to happen, even if you don't know that it is, even if in the moment there's no real indication um, that it, it's going to happen. Uh, we talked about it being about our dreams, our desires, and really being able to hold on to, you know, those things that, that you know, again, may not necessarily be seen. Um, we talked about, you know, having people in our group when it when it has to do with something that they might be expecting to happen you know we got people who are looking to travel we got people who are looking to you know get buy houses and and really create opportunity for themselves over you know the next few years and and again it is this ability to have hope even when things are happening you know have it, it that we're talking about because that's what hope allows you to do it allows you to keep driving forward even in a time where maybe there is you know, no real clarity about what might happen. So in our group, it was really about being able to see the finish line on things that maybe everybody else doesn't see, you know, and sometimes when you're really thinking about what's going to happen in a few years, you know, like whether it's meeting a favorite artist that's really been inspirational to you or being able to capitalize on a training that you've been taking, you know, a positioning that you set yourself up for, all of that has to do with hope and really being able to have a, a hopeful mentality during a time like this is pivotal. And I think one of the things that, that came out in our group that was so inspiring was just this recognition that we're working with young people who may not have ever had this type of opportunity, who may come from different environments or environments that, that you know, this notion of working virtually and whether or not they'll be able to accomplish it um, is, is a pivotal space for us to hold because maybe people didn't think that they'd be able to accomplish something like this. So the fact that, that this is an opportunity to be able to do something like that for those young people and continue to hold them up and support them um, is all of what hope can look like. That okay, group? Thumbs up, thumbs up in the group. Did we do all right? All right. So in our group, um, we talked about hope um, and and the way people are feeling right now. Like it might be a little bit hopeless. And some of the things that we're looking forward to, we have some um, graduates and soon to be graduates. So that was really exciting. Um, but we also talked about how would we discuss this with young people? Um, how would we do this type of activity with young people, especially the last question, thinking about one to two years, um, when if they're not graduating, like what are they looking forward to? But we did talk about how it is an important conversation to have. We want to keep our young people hopeful. And we even had a suggestion that maybe even before we start this activity, asking them to kind of do some visualization and close their eyes and kind of think about hope and things that they're hopeful about and then asking them to ask and then asking them the question to kind of give them time to breathe with all the things that's been happening recently. How'd I do group? Yay. Hey, cool. So uh, we talked about really how hope helps um, giving, give you some things to strive for and really gives you personal vision, helps you see the future. Um, opportunities to get back up after you've been knocked down, um, and really how hope gives you the idea of options and how important that was. Uh, we talked about the, um, some of the things that people were excited about was the opportunity to actually see young people um, and how seeing young people and being able to engage with them kind of gives life to them. Some folks are opening up some new businesses, which sounded really exciting. Um, and, and really something that's going to be really critical coming out of lockdown and as we, as we move forward um, is really how we move forward after loss. 
Um, you know, a lot of folks are losing folks from COVID and, and during this time, and how do we kind of kind of inspire hope to keep moving forward? Um, some folks are looking forward to showing young people tricks to get ahead, um, like working, working smarter, not harder, through using technology to, to better themselves. And, and overall, people really appreciated the opportunity just to be engaging with young people in this virtual space and uh, to be able to show them how to use technology in a different way. So I, I'm really curious to know if, you know, to hear from folks around, why do you think we decide to have this conversation with this group? Why, why, why do we decide we were gonna engage you in this conversation around hope? Anybody? Uh, I, this is what I really think. Um, <laughs> we we are we are we are um, what's the word? You you can't give what you don't have. If you don't if you really don't have any enthusiasm or hope for your own life, you really cannot transmit that. You, this is what I'm saying. You can't fake it till you make it when you work with people. You know, we always say people got five senses. People probably got 25 senses. The senses that really govern us are not physical. So I think I think maybe you, you guys engage us in this conversation and tap into our own hope. And, uh, and, and perhaps because we have to generate the same and, and, and help others to have that same type of hope. Thank you, anybody else? Um, maybe the um, our students, I guess, call them students, uh, our responsibilities, maybe they don't see the hope. Maybe we have to identify and support them in identifying hope and, and, and uh, identifying that hope comes in a lot of different packages. It's not, it's not how tall, not how cute, not how small. It, you know, it's really about who you are and, and working within your own personal package. Yeah, you know, I think you both really hit it on the head. You know, I think for us, you know, we, we're going to talk about mindset tomorrow and really the importance of growth versus and really understanding the concept of growth versus fixed mindset. And, you know, the, the concept of hope is, and, and if you're not excited about it, if you're not hopeful about it, you know, young people can even, as you said, they'll use that 25th cent to pick up. Hey, Steve's not excited about this, so I'm not logging on. You know, so just really being very clear that if you don't have that vision, if you don't have that hope, it's very difficult to drive that conversation, you know, with young people. Thank you. And I think more than that is when we're facilitating some of this, we have to have gone through some of these activities so that we can contribute. We do want to privilege you voice, but we also want to share some of our own experiences and make sure that we're also a part of the group. So in the, in the facilitator's guide, there's like a whole section on different activities and things you can do and different, uh, different resources around uh, helping your young people build hope. Um, so that, that's something that we've included for you. So just make sure you take a look at that in the facilitator's guide. And we'll talk more about that, obviously, as we move forward down the line with the training. All right. So we're thinking about looking at the role of hope and you know a lot of this kind of came up in the in the breakout room but one of the things that's really important about hope is that it gives us something to focus on other than the negative things right when we have hope we can pop we can focus on some of the positive things that are happening and it helps us eliminate some of the other noise that might might kind of keep us from being focused focus gives us strategy and one of the things that came up in our group a lot was the, 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 how hope gives you opportunities to do other things and, 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 and develop other strategies. Because if one strategy doesn't, get, doesn't work for you, hope gives you that opportunity and that space and that strength to get back up to move forward. And it also keeps you motivated, right? If you have hope, you're more, more likely to be motivated to complete a task. That being said, we're talking about routine and the importance of routine. And one of the things that we noticed, because we also work with a few groups of young people ourselves, was that 
by week two or three, their sleep patterns had gotten drastically turned upside down. They were staying up much later, um, really not trying to think about anything happening for them at eight o'clock in the morning, yet alone nine o'clock in the morning at 10, 10 o'clock. You know, my WhatsApp is going off at one o'clock in the afternoon talking about some good morning. Um, so really thinking about how, how important routine will be um, for helping get, getting young people back into the groove of things. Um, and just thinking about how difficult it will be, right, to establish routine, right? And so really being from the very beginning, thinking about intentional, what that routine is going to look like and how that's going to best serve your, your young people, right? Because if we're asked, asking them to log in on at eight o'clock and we know that's just not realistic or nine o'clock, we have to really think about where we can meet them so that we can have the best opportunity for participation as possible. Um, and then we want to be consistent in that routine because consistency in the routine is what helps young people stick to it, right? And then the last thing I want to really talk about is feedback and really the importance of feedback because feedback uh, has to be specific, it has to be timely, and you have to give feedback on both the positive things and the negative things that are happening because it helps the young person reflect on growth, right? And kind of what they're learning and what they're, what they're getting out of the, the experience. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the stories I tell sometimes is about the Hawthorne effect. And in the 1920s, there was a light bulb company and they decided they wanted to see whether light was affecting productivity in the factory. So they went around with their clipboards and they started raising the level of the light in the light bulb factory and production went up. But after a few months, production went back down and kind of leveled back off. And they couldn't figure out why, because they kept turning the lights up more and more. Um, so what they realized was that it wasn't, once they finally asked somebody, what they realized was it wasn't the level of light, it was the fact that somebody was watching them that rose the level of production, right? And after they, after they stopped, get, after they weren't getting any feedback on what was happening, they just assumed that they were just being watched to be watched, right? So they're making sure that we're giving feedback to young people so that they understand how they're growing as well, because that's going to be really important, not just the, not just the project, but also the process of getting to the end of the project is gonna be extremely important to helping our young people recognize the growth that they're happening during this process. And we do that by creating SMART goals, right? Anybody familiar with the, the concept of SMART goals? Yeah, I see some heads nodding, y'all, 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 a knowledgeable group, thumbs up. Okay, clap for me if you hear me. Um, you know, really thinking about making sure that we're creating goals, especially because we've talked about how it's very difficult. Our young people have, have to find new things to look forward to, right? So as we're talking about these things, we want to set both those short-term and those long-term SMART goals that are very specific, measurable. We want to make sure they're attainable, relevant, and that there's some sort of timeline associated with them. Because more than anything, we know we only have a couple of weeks that we're working with them. So timeliness has to be really important during this process. Right? And, and, here, and here's where if you think about like the last three, the art of your goal setting, like it's got to be attainable. It has to be relevant. And like Theo said, because we're working within a short span of time, it's got to be timely. So, you know, you really want to be able to lock in on those three aspects of it, um, especially because you think about the slide before where we talked about the development of routines. We're talking about working with young people who have had whatever routine they had with school turned upside down. And it's been turned upside down. As Theo said, you know, our group, our, the groups that we work with, we're real clear that they start, you know, the same young person I was talking to us at 10 o'clock in the morning when they should, when they were in school, was clearly not talking to us until one o'clock in the afternoon, but was referring to that as morning. So, so you're going to need to develop some new routines and get them going. So, you know, that la those last three parts are going to really be critical in this process. And that sets us up for what we're going to talk about next is really having a clear understanding of, of these two roles that you're going to have to play. Um, there is something about being an instructor and instructors are really the person who's leading the information sharing, really helping the young person acquire a new skill or acquire some knowledge or develop a level of understanding about whatever we're doing that we're gonna talk about as instruction. 
So when you're looking at the leader's guide or you're looking at other parts of the content that's associated with the work that you're doing, there are clear times when you're going to have to instruct. On the other hand, there's this notion of being a facilitator. And the facilitator's role is really about making it easier for the group to work together. The facilitator's job is to keep the group moving forward while at the same time making sure that they're doing that together. And one of the things that, that you'll find is that you're going to be, it's like wearing two different hats, and when, but, but you're the same person. And our time together is really going to be spent. You'll see where one of us may be providing information and serving as an instructor. And then two minutes later, we're going to turn around and we're trying to facilitate a dialogue. And so much of your work together this summer is going to be you balancing between those two and really having a clear understanding of when in advance, because remember, we want to be intent, we want to be intentional about which one you've got to do in order to keep the group moving forward. Is this a time for me to instruct or is it a time for me to facilitate? Okay. So again, when do I have to know the subject matter? If we're going to be working on building resumes, I've got to be real clear that today's activity is about resume writing. And I've got to know that by the end of the day or the end of my process, my young people have to come out with a completed resume. If that's the task, it's my job. It's not their job to figure it out. I've got to instruct. If it's about writing a letter or whatever, whatever it is that's associated with our projects, we've got to be real clear about what they need from us. While at the same time, we know that they know things and we don't want to become talking heads. So we've got to be able to understand as a facilitator, when am I going to bring them together and help them share what they know so that the rest of the group can look at them as a resource and can figure out if we're going to have this group project, as Theo said, we've got to be able to lean on each other and accomplish some things together. But we can't, again, expect them to do that on, our, on their own. That becomes our role as facilitators. If, it's in a, if we're in a breakout room like we just were, you notice that there was one of us in every breakout room. Not so that we could do the work for you, but so that we could be there to make sure that the prompt is there. We're not just sending you off to a room and be like, yeah, come back in three minutes with the answers to these questions, right? That's the fundamental difference and where we've got to be able to keep our eye on the prize. In project-based learning, there's no time where you don't have a role. You will always either be instructing or facilitating an aspect of the time that your young people are together. And just Does that to make sense? On, yep. And just to add on, just like if we're thinking about resume writing, the, the, the subject matter is going to be the resume writing, the facilitated part might be helping that young person identify the skills and things that they've done that need to be added to that resume. Does that make sense to folks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So again, what, what do we need to do in order to be a, an instructor? Well, we need to be an expert in whatever content we're talking about. Because one thing we know is there are going to be questions. And, and if the, the easiest way to lose somebody is to not be real clear about what content you're talking about, especially when we know that young people, like that's, that's their job. Find the crack, exploit the crack, and then drive a bus through it. And the quickest crack is for you to start talking to them about something, and then they realize that you don't really know what you're talking about, right? So, so in that instant, you've got to be the expert because you've got to present information. This is not about, you know, oh, well, maybe, or it's possible. It is straight information because you got to provide the right answer. Sometimes we let people say things and eh, there's no right or wrong. Well, when you're instructing, there is. There's always a right answer when you're providing content. And you've got to be really clear in that so that you can be 
kind of strong in your presentation. The facilitator, again, is guiding the process. We don't always know where, where, the, where it's going to end up. I started out trying to get you to talk about what your resume was, but because I wanted to let you use this game to talk about that, I've got to let it go because I'm, it's not about me being right or wrong. It's about the journey. My role in keeping us on task is always going to be about now asking the right question. How do I formulate the thought for you so that you can end up intentionally where I want you to go. So I'm not telling you what to do, but I know the right question to ask. So sometimes when, when, when we're doing that, again, it takes the same level of preparation to facilitate a dialogue that it will to provide instruction. Because again, I've got to be really clear that I'm guiding the process and I'm asking the right question that's designed to get the participants to where I want them to go. And that's gonna lead us to kind of like, how are we working? So there's two, and I know you heard this yesterday, so I'm, I'm not gonna you know, spend a lot of time on these two things. The asynchronous work, which is the work that the young person is doing online, that is all about the information. And in reality, it could be a, a recording of something. It could be a lesson plan. Those are the things that are going to be found in the website that the young person is going to go on. It's a task. They're going to accomplish it. And it's designed to have them learn something. But it's not necessarily being delivered in real time by you. So when you think about this asynchronous work, there it is. The synchronous work is the times when you're going to bring the young people together and you're going to engage them in some sort of a process. The group is going to be functioning in sync. And those are the two ways in which you're going to instruct and or inform your group. Again, it's content. When you think about it, the times that the young people are working on activities together, as you see in the, in the, 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 the image on the far left, like that's them. Our cute little group is working together. They're working from one presentation and they're figuring it out together. And everybody has a role in that synchronous experience. On the asynchronous time, I'm asking that young person to go off and do something on their own. It's the work that happens when the computer turns off, when you're not there, but the expectation is that they're still learning something. You've charged them with something that you've prepared in advance that's designed to teach them, as we said, a skill, let them get some knowledge, or help them better understand something. You're muted. <laughs> One of the things that we have found um, throughout this process, right, is, you know, because we also had to learn and grow as an organization as we went more virtual as well. Um, and one of the things that we, we, we started to do was we started to talk about this notion of touch points, right? And the touch points come into two different ways. We have our content driven touch points, which are our emails, our group chats, our text reminders, phone calls, calendar invites, right? And those are things that are happening for you as a facilitator outside of this design time, right? And I think that's the important piece to really think about is how am I gonna engage and interact with my young people when we're not in that structured time, right? Because a lot of things that we're seeing is, especially as, especially with school and, and young people having to log into Google Classrooms and things like that, there was just, um, a disdain that started to happen for these young people in terms of Google Classrooms. They're like, ah, Google Classrooms, ah, right? So we need to figure out how we're gonna engage and in, 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 in build relationships with them in different ways, right? So that's individualized communication. So that's the one-on-one -on -one kind of, here's an email from me to you. There's also the hosting of virtual games. I don't know if you've heard of Fibbage or Kahoot um, or House Party, but there are a bunch of other things out there um, that can really give you those 15 to 20 minutes when you're engaging with young people. And if you do it in the right way, you can start engaging families and, and other um, 
other folks that are in the household, right? And then using SCL tools such as mood meter and creating those real structured check-in moments. So like I said, um, these are just some of, the, uh, some of the options out there in terms of the, the virtual activities and games you can play. Uh, Fibbage comes with Jackbox. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but if you go online, uh, the package only costs like 19, maybe less than $19. And it's a multitude of games that you can play online with multiple people and all people need is their cell phones. Um, and it's very engaging. It only takes 15 to 20 minutes and it's free for your young people and it's minimal cost to you and you can use it with as many people as you want to. So it really is beneficial and it's really important to engage with your young people, not just with that time in that time when it's like, okay, so now it's project based learning time. Right. Really creating those other touch points with your young people in a way in which you're engaging with them so that you, you're building that connection with them. And I think also along with that, um, Theo mentioned um, engaging of families, um, being able to make um, calls to the families to, to I want to say caretakers and having conversations in which they also understand the expectations of their young person as being part of your group. One of the things um, that's going to be really important, this is a whole new world for everyone. We want to make sure that the support systems that they live with do understand what it is that they're doing and their expectations. And um, these games might also just kind of host in a little game time with stakeholders might be a way to build those connections and help them be vested with you. And with that said, it's really important that you trust your process. Um, you know, too often times we might say we're going to host this, we're going to host a game night and we, we put out the emails, we put out a flyer or two or whatever it might be, and three people show up and we're like, I'm never doing this again, right? But you have to understand that some of, this time, some of the times it takes consistency. So check your registration in advance, send regular emails, calls, text messages, DMs if you have to. Some folks are on Instagram more than they are on their emails. So that might be a place in which where, where you have to meet them. Um, interact with participants individually as much as you can. And when you're sending out those emails and those communications, do them daily, right? Do them at the beginning of the day so stuff kind of pops up. Those reminders are popping up in their inboxes right as they wake up, um, thinking about checking, hey, we have our, our, uh, our meeting, it's happening in an hour, you know, get ready to log in. Uh, and then just kind of at the end of the day, like, hey, you know, today we had 95% participation. Let's try to get to 100 tomorrow, you know, like, and just really kind of amping up that as much as possible. And then if you had a really good day, ask young people to provide testimonials for what happened in that day and why they liked logging in that day. Because those, those, those testimonials really go a long way. And the hope is that daily participation increases, right? And one of the things I keep saying is before you can do a group project, you have to become a group. And that's why we're spending really so much time here. You know, in a weird way, the work that we're going to be doing with young people is not work that they've done. It's stuff that they've done before. It really is. All It's happening in a different space. It's happening at a time that may not be the same for them. But so much of what this experience is going to rely on, as we said from the very beginning, is the relationship that exists between you and them. And clearly being able to form your group um, is going to be what's the most critical. You're muted. All of us got it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, with that said, really kind of thinking about how does a group form? Um, like Theo said, you can't have a group project unless you've taken time to form a group. And as you all go through your facilitator guide and you look at the, um, the youth facing components of the curriculum, we spend a lot of time in the whole beginning stage in, in the forming. And um, when the group <clears throat> The beginnings is the time when the group is, is first coming together. Um, engagement, 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 right? How are we engaging them? How are we um, incorporating new members? How are we norming? How are we setting expectations? What can I expect about this? 
and understanding that our job as facilitators is really um, to guide this process to make sure that young people are developing trust, that they're developing connection, that they know we care. So all of those things are happening in beginnings and it makes a difference um, the way the rest of the group goes. Now middles, middles is sometimes a difficult time, right? It's when the group starts to feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, but the great thing about middles is that we can also push a little bit more. Whereas in the beginning, we might, you know, just play a few games and have light touch and do getting to know you things. By the time the group gets to middles, they're gonna, um, it becomes a time when we can push them more, where we can have more activities. Um, for you all, it's also a time when we're going to be de developing our projects. And so the expectations may be both in the group and asynchronously is there's gonna be more expectations as young people take on their roles and think about things. Um, the important thing is, is that we understand what our role is as the facilitator, which is to continue to guide the group. And by the time we get to middles, it's almost like project management, making sure that we're doing everything behind the scenes to make sure that the project our young people want to do can um, come off um, successfully. And then endings. Um, I often say that endings are hard for people. Um, people don't like, it's hard to say goodbye. They don't like to, to say, um, to do endings. Um, in your facilitator guide, but also as you guys have done this work, um, thinking about preparing for endings as soon as possible, letting, making sure that young people know what is the life of this group, what is gonna happen, um, being able to celebrate them in a way that feels authentic, letting them know what skills did they gain, um, what were the experiences they had, and then figuring out what is going to be that final celebration piece. Is it going to be a presentation? Is it going to be an uh, in-person connection? How are we doing that? And then who at your agency is going to help you run those parts of it? Um, and we have to begin to think about that and get young people's buy-in on it and making sure that they're excited about it and that they're hopeful about it, which is gonna help um, push the project um, further. Um, and in your guide, you, it's gonna talk a lot more about what are the roles that you as the facilitator have in beginnings and middles and ends. Oh, here we are. So the role of the facilitator, thank you, Theo, you did everything. Um, the role of the facilitator um, in the beginning is really you guys have to decide the frequency of the meetings. You have to set up the norms. You have to set the expectations. You have to make sure that you're first and foremost in the process because um, they're going to be looking to you to make sure that everything um, works and, and that they feel safe in the space. Um, as we move in, you have to think about each time there's lots of decisions you're going to have to make about what the warm up exercises are going to be, um, what the icebreaker exercises, what kind of check ins are you doing. Um, there's some suggestions in the facilitator guide about setting up uh, meetings with them outside of the group. Um, but additional meetings might be maybe someone is not engaged um, when you guys are meeting. So maybe you might want to um, connect with them and say, hey, is something going on? Or maybe someone had great attendance and it starts to fall off. That's going to be your, your role as well. As you move into middles and more work is happening, your role might be to kind of assign some of those roles to, to um, smaller groups. Maybe there's someone who is like, make sure that, you know, everything is happening for this um, particular task that you have, maybe with logistics team. And um, it's my job to make sure that everyone on the logistics team is doing what they have to do and report it back to you, which is a great way for me to build my skill sets, but also for you to stay accountable to what's happening. Um, the other thing around beginnings is kind of making those connections among the group members. Um, sometimes when you're in front of the group and you're the facilitator, it's easy to have young people connect with you. But how are you giving them opportunities to connect? Um, one of the ways we did it is in our small group. You know, I got to talk with um, Ivan and I got to talk with Kylie and with Monique and kind of hearing about what's happening in their city, which made me feel like we connected in a really different way um, than I did with the rest of the group. Um, that's a great way to kind of think about how do you um, let them create relationships um, as well as 
push ahead the, um, the goals of the project. And then the other thing too is you have to be more active in the beginning than you do in middles. In middles, we get to pull back a little bit. We get to um, allow the group to kind of step forward. But until everyone feels safe and if they know their role, it really is our job to make sure that we're um, holding norms down. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I was saying that you had to make certain decisions about icebreakers, energizers, reflection, but also particularly your norms. Are you gonna ask them to keep their cameras on, right? Are you gonna um, have someone that's working with you to monitor the chat to make sure that folks feel heard? Are you gonna have someone to do um, um, to also be a, a lead with you to help you with the emails and to kind of meet with, with the group. And so these are some of the decisions that um, you guys have to make now so that when you get into beginnings, you're, you're kind of ready to get moving. Um, and then last but not least, really invite full participation and allow the group to define what that looks like, right? What does it look like for me to be fully participated? Does it mean um, that I'm not just there every day, but that I'm connecting with you on our off time? And I'm helping the group to decide that both with you as the facilitator, but with also with their, um, their colleagues. Um, does this make sense to folks? Great, thank you. So, so as we uh, get ready to wrap up, um, Shay, do you have the link? All right, so um, are folks familiar with Mentimeter? Anybody familiar with Mentimeter? Uh -huh. Looking to see if I see, no, nobody familiar with Mentimeter? All right, cool. Um, so what we're gonna ask you to do is to go to, um, what, what's the website, Pardis? Can you tell them? Menti.com. Menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And in the chat, Shaylan just put a code there. And if you enter the code at menti.com, and the code is 970916. In one word, how are you guys feeling after today's session? Can you share your screen, Shay, once, once people start populating it? Uh, stop my share, sorry. Go. What was the code again? Oh, I got it. Okay. I'm sorry, the code is 970916. Okay, it came in. Just one word? Yep, just one word. Was everybody able to find it? Folks able to find it? As, as uh, Shay Lanz is, is uh, kind of uh, getting that wrapped up and just want to close out today. So really, we spent a large part of today really talking about the relationships and how important that is um, because we really need to create the right environment that allow for this, for this project to grow. Um, so really thinking about the things that we're doing, the intentional work we're doing in order to get to, to provide opportunities for relationship building right from the get-go. 
um, just so that young people, like I said, not only form relationships with you, but form relationships with each other and start to get a feeling of a program or a project because that's, that's really important because if they feel like they're a part of something, they're more likely to engage with something. Yes, Shay. Uh, I'm ready. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. I will unshare. So some of the words that we have is excited, pumped, <laughs> excited, energized, informed, hopeful, optimistic, encouraged, Good way to get satisfied, one. happy, energized, informative, motivated, engaged, introspective, optimistic, absolutely <laughs> equipped. I love the teaching and educational tips, great resources and advice on how to lead the youth. Informed, enthused. And that was it. I think there was like 15. Awesome. All right. So the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna ask you for today um, just to do a quick evaluation for us. Um, and the way we do evaluations is kind of different. Um, one of the things that we always try to do is figure out different ways to incorporate technology to engage with young people as much as possible. So if you take out your cell phones and you hold uh, your camera over your camera function over the QR code, it'll take you directly to a Google link and to a Google page. And on that Google page, you'll see the evaluation. You can do it right there in real time. Um, and then that way, when you get off, you can look at the results. And if you need to change anything from today to next day, it's all very, it's all in, it's all in one place for you. It's all um, synthesized for you. And it's very easy for you to, to look at and then make the adjustments you need to make. Yeah. Um, and if you, as one of the things we'll do is we'll share some of the resources, like where you can go to, to, to create these things and kind of the process to make that happen for you, because it can be a very useful way, especially if you don't have someone to look at surveys, um, it can be a very useful way to gather information from your young people in a very quick, succinct way. Um, if you can't do it that way, um, Shayland, if you could drop the, the link for the survey in the chat, that'd be appreciated. Um, because already I, in, oh, already in. There you go. So if you, if you, if you uh, if it's if the link, the phone thing isn't working for you, uh, you can click on the link in the chat and you can do the evaluation there as well. Um, other than that, we would like to to thank you for being with us today for giving us your time. Um, tomorrow we'll be on the same bat channel, but at a different bat time. Tomorrow we will be on at 12.30, not 2.30. Um, just want to know, what, what time did y'all get started today? 8.30. 8.30. Oh, today was another 8.30 day. Okay. Okay. It's always an 8.30 day. <laughs> it's always at 8.30. <laughs> All right. So, so we'll, we'll be, we, uh, we, once again, we thank you for being here with us. We will continue to bring the energy um, and trying to, to be as engaging as possible, because as we know, these are some very long days for you, um, but we're very excited about be <laughs> we're, we're, we're very excited about the work that we're doing with you guys, um, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. If you have any questions, feel free to stick around and ask them if you need to. Um, but other than that, after you do the evaluation, you're free to go for the day. Okay. Wait, do we have to wait for Eric or, or are we just done with this? Kim? Oh. I was about to ask like, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 let's get some Kimberly's here. Somewhere. I think Kimberly's here. <laughs> I think that's, I think that I think that's what Kim, Kim's trying to talk to us. <laughs> Kim's muted. I think we have to go back to our other meeting, our previous meeting, the 830. <laughs> 
Okay, okay so using that, that first link. link. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, please. Yes, okay. thank you. All right. Hey, thanks, thank guys. You. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. So nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you, too. Theo left us too, huh? No, he's he's just on it. I know, I'm just too. <laughs> he dipped. All right, and we're clear. Clear. You were bringing the energy, Dennis. That was great. <laughs> Shayla was looking dying. Like, looking like a radio DJ. <laughs> Get it go, rap, rap, rap. Yeah. Make it back, rap, 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 rap. Well, they kept their cameras on. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was like. Me too. I think I only saw sign. like one person who didn't turn their camera on the whole time. But everybody else had their camera on. <clears throat> and and Eric and and Scott were only there for like five minutes. Yeah, it was it was weird because she was in my breakout room, and even in the breakout room, she didn't uh, turn her right. camera on. She but must did have she talk? Somewhere because she was like she talked. Oh, okay. She might not. Yeah, she 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 definitely talked in the small room. She has a very heavy uh, accent. She's definitely English is definitely her second second language. Right. Oh, okay. Definitely. <laughs> I had one person who was clearly like the Britney person. Who showed their camera in the beginning? You put them in the breakout room, but then another name came up to say that oh, Brittany's not here. So that was weird. Like some Renata, Renata something. I saw Renata, I saw Renata pop in. Right, but then, but then Brittany, I think got kicked out, but then came back. That was weird, but it was good. It was good. It was good. Yeah, it was good. I'm thinking like I'm you no. Know, I'm kind of scared, but I think I want. Oh, okay. I got it.